you've got the right intrinsics, just in terms of attitudinal makeup, right? Like you're somebody that works well in teams, you get along with others, you're dependable, you're hardworking, like you may not, you may not have worked in that industry, but you can learn. Hourly workers have always been the backbone of the U.S. economy. Employees who are paid an hourly wage for their service today account for over 82 million workers. That's a pretty big number, Jaime. It's over half of all wage and salary workers in the U.S. It's why I caught up with the CEO of Snagajob, Matthew Stevenson. Today, Snagajob is the country's largest marketplace for hourly jobs and shifts. They connect millions of job seekers per month to right fit employment opportunities across the U.S. They've got huge partnerships. I think they have 24 of the top 25 employers of hourly workers and thousands and thousands of small and mid market employers. Snag Job's mission is to empower hourly workers with the ability to design the way they work, not just for full time or part time, but also for flexible workers. So I caught up with the CEO of Snag Job, Matthew Stevenson, pretty cool track record uh, and an awesome business. Definitely one that's important right now as we think about the way work is changing. I wanted to catch up with Matthew, not just to talk about something really exciting like the jobs report, but I want to catch up on what he's seeing from a workforce trend perspective right now as we think about a post-COVID world where a future of work is shifting rapidly. With that, let's bring it in. So I guess, Matthew, to kick us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about Snag a Job, and then we're going to have a ton of questions uh, to dive into about workforce, but I guess out of the gate, if somebody didn't know for whatever reason, whatever you know planet they may be on that they're not here, not what does not know what Snag a Job is, what's your thirty second on Snag a Job? Yeah, it's the it, no, I appreciate you asking. Snag a Job is the largest platform for hourly work in the U.S. So in a given month, we help about six million workers find whether it be full time, part time, or increasingly gig based shift work across uh, over a million locations in the US and more than more than six and a half million jobs. What would be surprising to somebody that, um, you know, a lot of folks think about the workforce, they have probably certain uh, perspectives or pictures that pop into their head right out of the gate, you know, somebody that can work from home, somebody behind the desk, I guess, what, what would be uh, surprising for folks out there about you know, what the workforce really looks like from your point of view? Yeah, I, you know, I think there are a couple of misconceptions, uh, some of which I think, you know, COVID has, has shined a light on, you know, one is, I think, this realization of just the fungibility of skill sets, you know, I think pre pandemic, you know, I would hear a lot, particularly of hourly employers that would talk about the fact that they really wanted people from the industry, you know, because of the displacement of COVID, I think people suddenly became aware that you know, they were they were actually very successful hiring people from outside of the industry. And in fact, today we see the majority of hires in every industry are actually coming from outside of the industry. Um, two, I think is, you know, sometimes there's, I think, a misconception, which I think is, is wrong, that hourly workers aren't invested in their career and in growth within a company, that they're just there for the paycheck. And, you know, I, I personally think, like, I'm sure there's a segment where that may be true. But by and large, I think hourly workers want, frankly, what most people want, right? Like they want to be treated equitably. They want to understand sort of career pathing. They want to understand, you know, how they're contributing on a day-to-day -day basis and the impact that they're making. And I think we've seen that in, you know, some of the, what I would quote, you know, call almost sort of pseudo white collar programs that have started to become more of the norm in hourly that, you know, in a lot of cases were driven by major US retailers that, you know, those programs are having success, right? Because people are really valuing things like, hey, what's a clear like job pathing plan? Like they're valuing some of the other benefits that historically have been very much the domain of white collar employees. I read a uh, Gallup survey, it, you probably have seen it, came out in August and they made the claim that uh, they asked workers what percent of them feel that their manager, their kind of direct report cares about them at a personal level. That's right. And uh, I think the number came in at 24%. It was the worst at, on record on this specific survey by Gallup. Does that surprise you? 
Uh, no, I, I, I think it doesn't. I mean, I think I think that's 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 something that I think we we hear and see a lot. Uh, you know, candidly and hourly, the top reason that people leave jobs is actually not pay. Certainly, pay is is a component. But the top one is around like the work environment and particularly the leadership, right? And, and a lot of that is it's, you know, you know, the notion of a good boss. I think one of the things that I think COVID again has accelerated, but is very different from maybe even when I started working 20 some odd years ago, is just the, the notion of a leading with empathy, but then an understanding and just frankly, like caring for what employees are navigating through even beyond the work environment. I think that's one of the, frankly, like big changes in the last, you know, 10, 20 years is just that I think employers and managers have to be more cognizant of what's happening outside of the workplace. And even more so now in a remote environment where those lines of blur, that's even more important. But I think that's what employees care about, right? It's like, are you checking in on them on like, you know, how they're doing and recognizing some of the things that they might be going through either at work or outside of work? What do you think? Are there any specific tactics or, you know, for the talent leader or the maybe even the first time manager out there that doesn't want to be a bad boss and maybe is kind of promoted into that role? Are there any specific tactics or trends you're seeing the, from a leadership perspective in the organizations that are doing it the right way? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think a, a couple of thoughts there. Um, you know, one is, you know, and, and it's a very simple one, but oftentimes one that because of things that are on our mind, whether they be operational, et cetera, it's just like, are you at least weekly just checking in on, so, on how somebody's doing? Just asking that question, like, how are you doing both personally and professionally, right? That's probably the easiest. The other, and it's something, again, I think organizations were oftentimes loath to do in years past, uh, but is that much more important now is whether you're a manager, whether you're in the corporate office, that when you're communicating with, with, frankly, your colleagues, that you acknowledge what is going on both within the company and externally, right? Whether that's, you know, the hurricane last week and people that they, they know that might be affected, right? Like, I think just that acknowledgement, I think, is really important for folks. And then the last, which is, is one in every situation, right? Blue collar or white collar is like, how often are you actually giving people candid feedback and observations that help them in their career and even just linking that to where they might want to go so that people understand that you are vested in their career just as much as what they're delivering in that moment for the business. Totally. The, um, it's kind of like the before you clock in and after you clock out stuff. Yeah, That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and, I, and again, like testament to, I think the last few years, we've just seen that accelerate, right? Where, you know, now organizations, I think, are weighing in, frankly, on whether it sometimes be controversial social topics or things that are going on that historically they might not have. All that, I think, is just a recognition that employees want and expect for you to acknowledge that they have a life outside of work and there are things going on outside. And, you know, those impact their, their work and their life. Is this a great time to be a worker? And the reason I ask, and give you a second, because the reason I want to set that up is, you know, you see a press conference last week by Elon Musk, you know, rolling out a robot that's, you know, depending on which news outlet you read, it's everything from something yeah. that's going to help you to something that's going to, you know, change human civilization, depending on, again, on where you're getting your news. Uh, you know, you have Flippy the burger flipper in the back of house and restaurants that are that's taken away the fry station. Uh, I guess, is this a good time to be a worker? I mean, I, I, I think so, right? I mean, you know, one, obviously, if you think about the current moment that we're in, by any historical measure, this is the strongest labor market that we have ever seen, right? And so if you've ever had a dream job to apply to, like, now is the time to do it. Um, and then, listen, like, you know, I think, Change, change is inevitable. Uh, I tend to believe in that, you know, yes, there, there will be change. Do we, like, is robotics and the replacement of hourly workers probably long-term likely to have some impact? Sure, but I don't think it displaces things that, 
frankly, we know that humans are just fundamentally better adapted to do. And so I view it as it will create new opportunities. There will, there will be some roles that will obviously be impacted, but it will be, create new opportunities and put more emphasis on other skills, right? Like the social element of, of employees' roles will become that much more important if certain back, back of house operations are able to be automated or done via robot. And I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Like for somebody to be able to spend their time in different areas and engaging with customers, hopefully that's a good thing. We got a jobs report coming out uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Any, um, how closely are you watching it given your role at Snag and uh, any, any predictions? Yeah, I, uh, I'm expecting just like we saw in the JOLT report, uh, I'm expecting that we'll see continued softening, but still relatively robust job growth. You know, my 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 sort of guess or expectation is in the 200, 250,000 net job creation. I think what we are starting to see, though, in terms of the overall labor market is a bifurcation. I think where we're seeing that sort of slowing or cooling of the labor market is actually predominantly in white collar. Uh, my expectation is if if we do see you know, a mild recession, as the Fed predicts, that will be primarily in white collar. Because if you look at like even where the jobs have been primarily created over the last two years, uh, really the job growth has been in white collar. If you look at sort of net job creation in blue collar frontline industries, it's basically flat, right? Like there's still a million fewer people working in the leisure and hospitality industry than there were pre-COVID. Yeah, it makes you wonder, you know, as... Um especially in the front line and blue collar categories, the, the demand in those types of environments for workers to be able to continuously develop, reskill, be able to get onboarded quickly being very important given a lot of these environments, whether it's restaurants, hospitality, retail, still say uh, finding talent is, you know, maybe number one, if not, you know, top mm -hmm. two challenge today. Uh, but once they find them, how do they develop them and keep them and in some ways position them for the next role? I guess any, any thoughts around talent development uh, for organizations and, you know, is, is it, uh, you know, we've, we've moved from a world where job training was in many ways, a kind of event one and done to a world yeah. where it feels like with automation, we're not this, it's kind of like continuous is is the way to go. Any thoughts around talent development? Yeah, I, I mean, this is again, you know, where I go back to, I think what has historically been a misconception about uh, the investment that hourly workers want to make in their employer and their career. Um, and, you know, I think, the, again, the white collarization of blue collar that we have seen with, you know, a number of employers rolling out, you know, whether it be formal education programs, whether it be accelerated managerial job pathing, whether it be, you know, benefits historically reserved for white collar employees, like, like mental health or even maternity and paternity leave. Like, I think clearly those were done in the context of a tight labor market. But I think if you look at the early results of those, because again, the longevity of those will depend on the ROI. The early results are really promising, right? Like if you look at what, like a Chipotle as an example, has published around the results of their program, it's pretty remarkable, right? Around what you see in terms of like the progression, the retention rates of the employees who have self-selected into those programs. And so I think, again, it's a it's a strong signal, like there's a desire there. And sometimes we have to be willing to challenge some of our own sort of, you know, misconceptions around what, what people actually really want. I do a lot of work uh, locally or, you know, kind of we're based here in, in Newark, New Jersey, and do a lot of work in the community with workforce development programs, reentry yeah. programs, homeless youth. Um, any advice for um, folks out there who are, you know, trying to figure out how to take the next step in their career or trying to figure out uh, how to get off the sidelines? Uh, you know, again, for the for the worker that's out there that's listening, that is uh, trying to consider how they how they step up. Um, what do you have to say to them right now? Yeah, I, I think I mean a couple of things. You know, one is again remember that there are still almost two jobs for every person looking, and so it is it is a great time to be a job seeker. And I know it may not always feel that way when you're the individual looking, but it's important to remember like people need you, 
And two is, you know, don't get caught in the trap of saying, well, you know, I worked in X industry or I've only done X, like how do I work in Y? I think one of the great silver linings of COVID has been the realization that people have that frankly, like the training can happen on the job. What matters most is somebody's attitudinal makeup. And if you've got the right intrinsics, just in terms of attitudinal makeup, right? Like you're somebody that works well in teams, you get along with others, you're dependable, you're hardworking, like the rest can be trained. And I think that's a big change that I think employers have recognized over the last couple of years. And so frankly, have the confidence to know that, you know, you may not, you may not have worked in that industry, but you can learn. I mean, I love the work you're doing. I think that the, you know, we need, um, you know, we need more, um, whether it's organizations, initiatives, people that are um, helping us to see the talent in every worker that exists today in the workforce. And I want to ask you just a final question. Um, with all the talk of future of work, what is what is your hope for the future of work? Yeah, I, I, I think for me, and obviously I think a lot about the future of hourly work. There are probably two things that I hope and, and candidly expect to see over the next five, 10 years. One is that the best hourly workers in their respective profession, whether that's being a cashier, a dishwasher, a barista, or a, you know, a warehouse associate, that through their profile, that they are able to, one, um, command a premium for their services, just like the best in their respective professions in white collar are able to do. And two, that increasingly, like you may be the best barista in the world today, but unless you go to a you know, site and look for a job, jobs don't find you. And I think that psychologically for hourly workers will be one of the great changes that we will see is that they will actually have jobs that seek them out. And psychologically, I think that confidence building is so powerful. The other that I, that I increasingly believe is hourly much more so than white collar. Like the notion of how you work is much more fluid, meaning do you need full-time, do you need part-time, do you need a mix of full-time and some individual gig work? I think we're starting to see the evolution where workers are now being able to tap into multiple different income streams while still having a home. I, I don't view it as a future of like everyone becomes a professional gig worker. I don't, I don't think that's the case. Certainly not in hourly. That people value having a home to build their career, but the notion where more flexibly they can pick up and earn supplemental income leveraging their skill set, I think is going to be a huge revolution for hourly workers and frankly for employers as well in terms of meeting uncertain demand. Great. Well, Matthew, uh, wishing you the best of luck the rest of the year and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We talked about the major misconceptions about hourly workers today. Uh, we talked a little bit about how Managers need to show a vested interest in workers' growth and well-being. I think we've talked about that a bunch before. We also talked about what type of ROI companies are seeing when they invest in their people, whether it be upskilling or health benefits. And we're living in a time where the conversation around future of work is often filled with discussions about robots, AI, virtual reality. And there's a scarcity in discussion about the people at work. So I enjoyed this opportunity to catch up with Matthew and snag a job. The work they're doing every day is aimed at not just helping brands find people, but it's about helping people find brands. I'm not even going to charge them for that one, Heine. Now you heard it. We talked about a lot of stuff. I appreciated Matthew's perspective on training happening on a job. I appreciated his optimism that it's a great time to be a worker, but I most appreciated his perspective that any worker can acquire the knowledge needed to perform any job at work. It's possible, it's capable. It's not about skilled versus unskilled workers as uh, so many folks out there, you I still don't know why we call workers unskilled. It's about possibility, it's about capability, it's about seeing your people. And it's that that I think is most important right now as leaders in our workforce to come in every day and see the potential in our people. So thank you to Matthew Stevenson for joining me. Now don't forget to subscribe to Bring It In so you never miss an episode. We've got some awesome guests lined up that you're not going to want to miss. Now, back to work.